Um, Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, and let's uh, start with a prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this opportunity to, to look into your word and, and uh, examine it and uh, try and get what out of it as much as we can. We're going to look at the prophetic, prophetic program of the nation Israel. And uh, we ask that you, that you would uh, give me clear speech and a mind to it and, and open minds to the listeners to, to get from your word whatever they can. And we give you all the praise in the name of our Lord, Savior, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, if you would, get Ezekiel 21 to start. Uh, verse 24 to 27. And it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Because you have made your iniquity to be remembered, in that your transgressions are discovered, so that all your doings, your sins do appear. In all your doings, your sins do appear. Because I say that ye are come to remembrance, and ye shall be taken with the hand. And thou profane wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come, when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem, take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. And it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. So God is going to take the crown of world rulership away from Israel because they have absolutely refused to do as they've been instructed. And he's going to give it, first off, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. If you would, come on over to Daniel chapter 2 now. And in Daniel chapter 2, this is the second year of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, 2 verse 1, And in the second year of Neb the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep brake from him. Then the king commanded to call his magicians and astrologers and sorcerers and the Chaldeans to show the king his dream. And they, he called, you know how it goes with a dream. If you, I have dreams, and you wake up in the morning, and you, what was that? And, you know. And then you can't remember all the details of it. You just remember little snatches and bits and pieces. And, and this was probably the situation with Nebuchadnezzar. He had this dream, and now he can't remember exactly what it is. So he tells, and he knew his, his uh, magicians and Chaldeans that they were a bunch of charlatans anyway. So he calls them to get them to tell him what his dream was, and to interpret it. Uh, turns out they can't, don't have a shot at it at all, and they acknowledge that. So Daniel uh, finds out that information, and uh, he comes to the king and uh, asks him to give him some time, and he'll tell him the dream and the interpretation. Uh, and if you come down to... Uh, Verse 28 of chapter 2, Daniel comes in and speaks to the king and said, and Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, verse 27, the secret which the king hath demanded the, cannot the wise men, the astrologers and magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and maketh known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days. And then he goes to tell him the dream. In verse 31, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. And here we get the description. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, 
his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. So Daniel has described to him his dream, and now he's going to tell him what it means. In verse 37, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it had break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So one thing you need to notice in this interpretation that Daniel gives he doesn't give Nebuchadnezzar much detail. He doesn't name the other kingdoms. The only one that gets named and identified is the first one, and that's Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, thou art this head of gold. It's speaking specifically of Nebuchadnezzar and directly to him. And Nebuchadnezzar was not the first king in Babylon. Uh, if you would go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 12 and 19. And we're in the time of Hezekiah, king of Israel. Uh, and in the earlier, uh, we, if we start at chapter 12, back in, in chapter 1 of, of, I mean, in verse 1, excuse me, of chapter 20, don't let me confuse you. Uh, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And uh, Hezekiah turns his face to the wall, and he prays to God. And uh, God uh, sends Isaiah back to him and says, okay, God's given you another 15 years. And so 
when we come down to verse 12, uh, at that time, Barodak Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things. These, these guys show up for another kingdom far away, and first thing he does is show them everything he's got in the place. Uh, he showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointment, and all the house of his armor, and so on. And the tail end of that verse says, There was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto king Hezekiah, and said unto him, What said these men, and from whence came unto thee, they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thy house? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thy house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Hezekiah's response, verse 19. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? No sweat, as long as I don't have any problems. <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> A head scratcher. So, but, um, so, Nebuchadnezzar was not the first king in Babylon, but he's the one that God chose at that time to take, punish Israel, to take Israel out of the land. And he takes them out of the land for 70 years. And King Nebuchadnezzar and his son and his son's son, uh, Jeremiah 27 verse 5 to 11, where Jeremiah prophesies that, that, and he calls Nebuchadnezzar my servant. Uh, Jeremiah 5, I, or 27, 5, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and have given it unto whom it seemed to meet unto me. And now, have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and the beast of the field have I given him also to serve him, and all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the very time of his land come, and then many nations and great king shall serve themselves of him. So Nebuchadnezzar is called by the Lord, my servant, because he's going to use Nebuchadnezzar to punish Israel for their disobedience. The 70 years is because the whole time that Israel was in the land, they never observed the Sabbath for the land. That was every, every seventh year was supposed to be a year when they didn't plant the land. They allowed the land to just lie fallow and they just ate from whatever came up and uh, God had promised them you do this let the land rest every seventh year and it'll produce all that you need to consume and on the year of Jubilee after seven sevens the 49th year then the 50th year the year of Jubilee they were supposed to do the same thing for that year too and God had promised them that on that last year before the seventh, that it would produce enough when they gathered that in that it would feed them for three years. They had to let it lie and fallow the seventh. 
the 50th year and then not plan until the year after Jubilee and then take it again and go back into production. And God promised that that, that year before it would produce enough for three years for them to eat until they planted the land again. But the whole time that Israel was in the land, they never observed those Sabbaths for the land. So God, when he takes them out, he takes them out for 70 years. That was the number of those Sabbaths that they failed to observe, to let the, the land rest. So... Uh, now, uh, Jeremiah said that, that Nebuchadnezzar, his son, and his son's son. Well, we know Nebuchadnezzar. We see him mentioned quite a bit. And in chapter 5, uh, Belshazzar, who is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, we see mentioned because he's there when the Medes and the Persians come in and conquer Babylon. Uh, he's the guy that sees the handwriting on the wall. And, uh, but Nebuchadnezzar's son only shows up one place in Scripture. And that is 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 27 to 30. And it came to pass in the seven and thirtieth year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, did lift up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, out of prison. And he spake kindly to him and set his throne above the throne of the kings that were in him with Babylon, changed his prison garment, and he did eat bread continually before him all the days of his life. And his allowance was a continual allowance given him of the king, a daily rate for every day all the days of his life. And 20, uh, 2 Kings 24.12 tells you that Jehoiachin was taken captive in the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar. So if you add the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar to the 37 years that, that Jehoiachin was in prison, uh, you have a reign of Nebuchadnezzar for approximately 45 years. Then his son takes over, and that's the only thing we know about him from Scripture. Then when you come to chapter 5, you see Belshazzar having a big party on the last night of his reign. He just doesn't know it's the last night. And... Uh, Daniel comes in and tells him the, what's going on with the handwriting. And it says, in, in that night the Medes and the Persians, thy kingdom is, is taken and given to the Medes and the Persians. So, but other than naming Nebuchadnezzar, that's all the detail that Daniel gives to Nebuchadnezzar about his vision. He, he talks about the other three kingdoms, but he doesn't tell him who or give him any other details about it. But Daniel, after, uh, in beginning in chapter 7, has visions of his own that God gives him that gives us details about the rest of those kingdoms. Because, uh, in, if you go to... to uh, Daniel chapter 7, that's the first vision that he receives. And actually, the vision in that chapter 7, uh, he receives in the first year of Belshazzar, so which is the grandson, king of Babylon. And he has a dream here. And... Uh, he sees four beasts. In verse 2 it says, Daniel spake and said, I saw my vision by night, and behold, four winds, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Well, um, that term, the great sea, if you look in Numbers 
34, verse 6, you see that term again, and it's a reference to the Mediterranean Sea. So it's in that territory around the Mediter that western or eastern shore of the Mediterranean that these beasts come from. Uh, and it goes down through there and lists all four of them. The one most important is the fourth one. But the thing we want to understand, these four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. Now these turn out to be not kingdoms, but just kings. Okay, Because Schofield and, and Larkin and some of those early guys, they try to tie these four to the image in Daniel 2 that Nebuchadnezzar sees. But Daniel doesn't get this vision until the first year of Belshazzar. That's the grandson. And he's toward the end of the Babylonian kingdom. And if you would look at verse 12 of Daniel chapter 7, it says, as concerning the rest of the beasts, and this is in reference to the first three, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. So these, all four of these beasts are on the earth at the same time in that area. Now whether those three are the ones which uh, when the Antichrist comes up among those, that ten nation confederacy to get power, he takes three of them out. But uh, if that's the case, it might not be these three because it says concerning the rest of the beast in verse 12, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Uh, and in verse 11, uh, it's talking about that fourth beast, about the great swelling words which he spake. And Daniel says, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Okay, he's cast into uh, the lake of fire. But in verse 12, the other three, they have their dominion taken away but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And so they're there simultaneously. Maybe they are in, the, in some of the other area that the Antichrist doesn't hold control over. But uh, maybe they just rule at the same period of time that he does, but it's clear that they're all four there at the same time simultaneously. They're not in series like the vision in Daniel chapter 2. If you come over then to Daniel chapter 8, Daniel gets this vision in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. Chapter 7 was in the first year of his reign. Two years later, he gets the vision in chapter 8, and here he's given information about the second and third kingdom. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first, a reference to chapter 7. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw uh, that I was in Shushan in the palace, which was in the prophets of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Eli. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the he-goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him. He was angry with this guy. And smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great. 
And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. That's a reference to Israel. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the, star, of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. And he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. So this tells us that little horn comes out of one of the divisions of the kingdom of Greece. Uh, if you come to verse 20, we get the identification of the ram, the first beast. The ram which, that saw, which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. Okay, so the second beast, the beast that's represented by the breast of silver and arms of silver is Media Persia. There's two arms, there's Media and Persia. Uh, Media is the little horn that was there, came up first, and Persia is the second greater horn that came up second. But uh, that identifies for us the second kingdom, that's Media Persia, and then verse 21 in the interpretation given by the angel, Gabriel, uh, and the rough goat, the second beast he saw, is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So there, the third kingdom, the brass, the belly and thighs of brass, is Greece. And we know that because that's what it says right there. The great horn between his eyes is the first king. And the first king we know of Greece is Alexander the Great from our ninth grade world history class. <laughs> that was the first king of Greece. So that identifies the second and the third beast. Now, the Media Persia is um, noted for possibly one thing, when Media Persia takes over, Babylon is finished. The 70 years that Nebuchadnezzar and his son and sons held Israel out of the land in captivity, the 70 years is over. And Cyrus, the king of Persia, Allowed, de makes a decree and allows the Jews that wish to return to return back to the land and to Jerusalem and he makes a decree to allow them to rebuild the temple. He even sends all the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar removed. He gives them back to him to take back to the land. And then a couple of Ahasuerus's later, <laughs> the kings in, in, in Persia, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 2, he gives permission for Nehemiah to go back in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 5. Uh, Nehemiah says, And I said unto the king, If it please the king, if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. So there's the decree that allows the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the city walls and the gates. And that's notable because in Daniel chapter 9, that vision in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, uh, it says, when he's, he's getting the calendar, the new calendar, the 70 weeks thing is over with, now there's a new time schedule that is established. And in verse 25, 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Okay, there's the first 69 weeks of years. And it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, and that's what you've got in Nehemiah 2, verse 5, is that commandment given by that king, a Persian, to Nehemiah to go back and begin to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And when they go back, he has all kinds of, just like the group that went earlier to rebuild the temple, the people in the land that were left there after Nebuchadnezzar took Israel out, they give them a lot of static about doing that. So the, the city and the walls are beat, built in troublous times. So that first seven weeks, that 49 years, the city is rebuilt, the walls are rebuilt, and Jerusalem is established. And that begins the calendar of the 70 weeks of years until Messiah the Prince. Because it says, the, in, to restore and build Jerusalem, from, from the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, and that's the first appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ in his earth, for his earthly ministry, uh, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So, uh, and if you've ha read or, or know about a fellow by the name of Sir Robert Anderson, he was, a, he was an early uh, 20th century, well, he lived in the early 1900s, uh, late 1800s or early 1900s. He was, he was the head of Scotland Yard in England for a number of years, but he was a Christian and he was a, uh, uh, did a lot of study. And he figured out the dates exactly because 69 weeks of years turns out to be 173,880 days, okay? And, and he, he did all the math and then counted from the decree, which he says was March the 14th, 445 B.C. to April... Um, And I don't have that number written down. But to the day that the Lord Jesus Christ, which he, he uh, numbers in his book, the day that the Lord Jesus Christ rode the little mule into Jerusalem on what's called Palm Sunday, and all, all the disciples were following him, and, and the people that were following laying the palms down for him to ride in, he rode into Jerusalem and presented himself to the nation of Israel as the sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world. From 445 B.C., March 14th, to that day, it turns out, according to Sir Robert Anderson, is exactly 173, 880 days. So it matches the calendar exactly. And then, after the three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. The crucifixion wasn't that day. That's, that was the day in the Passover feast that Israel was to go out and select their lamb. And then they were supposed to watch it for three days to make sure that there was no blemish in it. And then they killed the lamb on Passover. Christ is, is presenting himself to Israel as the Passover lamb exactly on that day. And then... Three days later, he's crucified. Then, that last 70th week, there's a pause in the, in, the, in the description. It doesn't run right up against the end of the 69th week. 
It's delayed. There's a delay there. So, Media Persia is, is the breast and arms of silver. Greece is the belly and thighs of brass. And then, notice, in, 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 recall that in, in chapter 8, that in verse 8, the great horn of Greece was broken, and for it came up four notable ones. So Alexander's kingdom, he dies at the age of 32. He's conquered. He's come out of Macedonia, conquered Egypt, Babylon, Persia, and went all the way over into India in really amazingly fast time. He was, he was an unusually talented general. And, uh, but then he got over there, and there was a big mountain range in front of him, and it was wintertime. And his guys were been, had been away from home for a long time, and they were getting a little fed up with <laughs> being away. So they stopped his advance. He went back to Babylon, and he died in Babylon at the age of 32 in 323 B.C. And then his four, his kingdom doesn't go to his offspring. His generals start squabbling about it. And for 20 years, they're fighting over the areas and trying to divide them up. Eventually, at the end of 20 years, I think they just throw up their hands and, and they divide it up into four different areas. So it said... Uh, The great, he, he waxed very great, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. But if you'll come over to chapter 11, we get a much more deep, this is Daniel's last vision, we get a much more detailed look. At it, if you will. Uh, This vision covers chapter 10, 11, and 12. Chapter 10 is an introduction to the vision. Okay? And, and verse 14 of chapter 10 is key. Uh, it says, now, uh, Gabriel is talking to him. Now I'm come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. And in verse 1, Gabriel says, also, in the first year of Darius, the meat, even I stood up to confirm and to strengthen him. And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far which, richer than they all. And by his strength and through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Okay, so there's Persia and Greece. In verse 3, and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. There's Alexander the Great. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. So his four generals divided up. And then in verse 5, it says, and the king of the south. So right there, between the end of verse 4 and the beginning of verse 5, there's a big time gap. Because in verse 5, it says, and the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of years, key, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm. But she shall be given up, and they, shall, they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. 
but out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which will come with an army. And if you read down through that all the way to verse 20, you see the king of the north and the king of the south. There's the identity of the legs of iron. And they come out of one of the territories of the Greek kingdom. And as you read down through there, of course, you've got to carefully keep track of which, which ones. They name them as they go down through there, but they're not, each time they refer to them, they don't always name them. So you have to, have to be kind of pay attention to who's who. But you've got the king of the north and the king of the south, and they are scrapping with each other. Over and over. And, and what they're fighting, and the, what's between their fighting is the nation of Israel. So they're in tough times, having a hard time. You get down to verse 20. Uh, in verse 19, in reference to the king of the north, then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days, he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in verse 21, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and attain the kingdom with flatteries. There's the Antichrist. In verse 22, and with the arms of a flood shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And we know again that that's the Antichrist because he's the one that confirms the covenant with Israel to reestablish the temple worship. Verse 23, And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. And... Yeah, you come down through there and get to verse 31. Here's the middle of the week. An arm shall stand up on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination in Mecca desolate. So you would get to 31. There's the middle of the 70th week. He goes into the temple. Stops the sacrifice. Says, I'm God, worship me. And this guy has a two-tiered uh, career. If you would come Second Thessalonians. You've seen this verse used before. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. Uh, he says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The first half of the week, he's the man of sin. He's, he's just a man, but he's an evil guy. If, if you go down through all that stuff in Daniel chapter 11, you see there's all kinds of deceit and, and trickery and, and, and smooth talking going on, and then... He, he makes the covenant with Israel, and then in the middle of the week, he breaks the covenant. And so the first part of the week, he's the man of sin. The second part of the week, he's called the son of perdition. Uh, and that's an interesting term right there. If you would uh, come to John chapter 12, or... John 17, verse 12, I'm sorry. There's, there's one person that's been on the earth that's been called the son of perdition. John chapter 17, verse 5. The Lord Jesus Christ is praying, talking to God the Father, uh, speaking about his ministry. And in verse 12, he says, While I was with them, in reference to his uh, apostles in the world, I kept them in thy name, those 
that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And uh, that's a reference to Judas Iscariot as the son of perdition. If you come on over to Acts chapter 1, in verse 25, Peter's speaking, uh, and he's talking to the rest of them, the, the apostles there, about the necessity to appoint another one to replace Judas. Uh, verse 24, And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas fell by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. So when Judas hung himself, he had a special place that he went to. If you come over to uh, Revelation 13, uh, actually, while you're going by it, stop in Revelation 9. In verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star, which is an angel, fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the power of scorpions of the earth have power. But there was an angel came down and opened the bottomless pit. Come over to uh, chapter 13. Verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven, he seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. There's the guy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two weeks. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, and his tabernacle, and then that dwell in there. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Now drop over to chapter 17, please. And verse 8. Uh, an angel's going to explain to John this this. Uh, woman and the beast that she's riding on. Verse 8, the beast. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. And where'd that thing come from? It shall ascend out of the bottomless pit that the angel opened. And this thing was, it was on the earth, it is not now, and it shall be. 
when the Antichrist receives that wound, one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. In the middle of the week, the Antichrist receives that wound with a sword that is on his arm and one of his eyes. It's a deadly wound. He dies from it. Then the beast that ascendeth up out of the bottomless pit, that spirit reanimates the body of the Antichrist in a false resurrection. The Antichrist is a false Christ. Satan is a false god. And the, the beast out of the earth there from chapter, or verse 11 of chapter 13 on down, the false prophet, there's the unholy trinity. And that's the duplication. That's Satan's plan to try and replicate what Christ and God did in gaining salvation for us. Whoop, watch out for that thing. So there's, there's the false trinity. And they're allowed to make war against the saints and overcome them. And the, uh, but that's not the final outcome. Here's the end of the matter. Drop back to Daniel chapter 2, if you haven't let that go yet. Verses, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 and 45. the end of the vision. And in the days of these kings, and that's the ten kings of the Antichrist kingdom, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It's going to destroy the kingdoms of the Antichrist and all the kingdoms on the earth shall be destroyed and it shall destroy them and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and then it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay the silver and the gold the great God hath made known unto the king and that's speaking of Nebuchadnezzar what shall come to pass hereafter and the dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. The end. Any, dare I ask if anybody's got any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have a question. Okay. seems to identify um, Antichrist, mm -hmm. and then there's a verse that seems to identify the false prophet. So um, I was trying to find that verse, and, and I was going to ask you if, if you think that it could be. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't, in that particular verse, verse 4, I don't see anybody Nine with the Antichrist. Four. I'm it's oh, just, it's, it's, it's somewhere in, in here. general too. area. Uh, I'm trying to find it. That wicked because it, it says the son of perdition right there. Uh, the 
false prophet is tied in, but I don't see him mentioned anywhere because it, it talks about him and then the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Oh, he, I found it. Oh, okay. Verse 9. Nine. Okay. See where it says, uh, even him there? Mm -hmm. Who is com whose so coming I is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Uh, okay, I'm wondering that, if that even him could possibly be the false prophet. That is, well, the, the, the him there is, is, is uh, generally a reference to that wicked mm -hmm. in verse 8, which is the Antichrist. But that's what that guy's doing in, in Revelation chapter 13. He's, he's given power to do all these signs by the Antichrist who's empowered by Satan. So there's going to be a whole lot of supernatural stuff going on in that last, particularly the last half of that week. Satan's thrown out of heaven and his angels, and they're thrown down to the earth. And the Antichrist is given his power and seat and authority by Satan. He'll have power over these. He'll even have power to direct and control those angels that follow Satan in the rebellion in the heaven. They're cast down with him. And the Antichrist has his power given to him from Satan. He can control these guys and have them doing stuff. And let me, one other thing. Uh, Come to Genesis chapter 6. Verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, those are angels, saw the daughters of men that were fair, and they took them wives of all which all which they chose and there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men they bare children unto them and the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown and it wasn't just in Genesis chapter 6 when Israel shows up in the land it's full of these guys David kills one of them with his stone sling Goliath who was six cubits and something tall. This is a big guy, a cubits 18 inches. This sucker's around nine foot tall. And, uh, and they're uh, all through, uh, when, they're, when they go into the land, actually when they sent the, the spies into the land, they came back and said, yeah, it's a great land, but this place is full of giants. We can't beat these suckers. And, and refused to go in except for Caleb and Joshua. They were the only two that said, no sweat, man, God will take care of them. But, and in the end time here, these guys are going to be there again. There's going to be all kinds of supernatural stuff going because Satan gives the Antichrist his power. And he, the false prophet, can do all kinds of miraculous signs. So, just because somebody does some miraculous sign doesn't necessarily always mean it's from God. Yeah. Right. You gotta be real careful, yes, man. Well, during Job's time, yeah. he was doing all kinds of miraculous things yeah. to demolish Job. Job, yeah. Yeah. So it's gonna be an interesting time. Fortunately, we're not gonna be here involved in it, but we get a ringside seat. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm not sure I was following your train of thought, but when you were talking about, uh, let's see, John 17, where Judas Iscariot was called a son, son of perdition, perdition. Yeah. Where you, it almost sounded like you were alluding to the fact that he's going somewhere and then he, he might be coming back this, as the this, Antichrist. This, this, no, he's not coming back as the, as the Antichrist. He's the spirit that comes out of the body, his spirit that comes out of the bottomless pit and revives the body of the Antichrist in a false resurrection. The dead body is laying there and this spirit out of the bottomless pit animates the body for the second half of the, of the 70th week. 
whose body is that? The Antichrist. But, but, okay. But yeah, he's killed. He receives a wound oh, with a okay. sword. Oh, okay. that's after yeah. you. He's okay. killed with a, he's, he receives a, a fatal wound with okay. a sword. Gotcha. And he lays in state for three days. The spirit comes up out of the right. uh, bottomless pit and reanimates the body. Okay. So, uh, thank you for this clarifying. Demonic, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a demonic yeah. thing. Yes. Well, it seems what you clarified for me that I hadn't really put together as far as puzzle pieces mm -hmm. was that it was. Uh, the two legs represent okay. the the king of the north and the king yeah. of the south, which are from the the Greek, right? Yes. The, the generals, one of the divisions out of the Greek the, Empire, yeah. which um, are Thrace, Egypt, Syria, and Macedonia. Mm -hmm. Those kingdom and those four pieces of of the in, the division yeah. of of. Um, Alexander the Great's Great kingdom. Empire, yeah. So somehow the, you get a king of the north and a king of the south, and those are the legs, and not the, not the Roman. Yeah. Not the Rome the has Roman absolutely nothing. Empire. It's, to do with it has to do with the. Greek Rome's Greek not in the prophecy anywhere. Rome only happens to be in place when Christ shows up the first time in his his earthly ministry, the first coming, uh, and. What I say is that you look at that just like you did John the Baptist. In Malachi, it says Elijah comes, and in Isaiah, uh, that Elijah is the forerunner of the Messiah. And uh, the angel tells John's dad that he's going to have a son and he will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. When John shows up and baptizes in the wilderness, the rulers in Israel come out. They hear about this and they come out to see what's going on and they question him. And one of the first questions they ask him is, art thou Elias? John says, no. And then, who art thou? And then he repeats, to identify himself, he repeats the passage in Isaiah that describes Elijah's coming. But in Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist is in jail, and he sends some of his disciples to question Christ, are you the guy we should be looking for? Do we look for somebody else? And Christ sends them back to tell John to look at the miracles, the things that, that I'm doing. And, and then he starts talking to the people around him. And he says, if, about John, but he says, if thou will receive it, and the it is the verse up above in reference to the kingdom, if Israel would have received Christ as Messiah, John the Baptist would have been Elijah. So that it was a legitimate offer of the kingdom. Amen. Yes. But in, in the... Um during the tribulation, mm -hmm. Elijah and Moses yes. will be Are there. The two witnesses. The two witnesses yeah. before the second coming of Christ. Yes. So we have Elijah then. Yes. So that's the actual coming. John the Baptist was because Christ, uh, God, in his foreknowledge, he didn't get fooled. He knew Israel wasn't going to accept the Messiah the first time he showed up. So he sent Elijah instead. And Rome happened to be in power. Instead, what he did was that with the breakup of the Greek Empire, he held back the events that would lead to the rise of the Antichrist, and Rome's there instead. Yes. Okay. I'm a little confused still because uh, wasn't Rome the, the iron at any point in this whole thing? Was Rome ever the iron? But no. it was the Rome empire in in yeah. control when yeah. Christ came. Yeah, but so, they didn't receive Christ. Okay, so and so the, the iron really is Greece, or no? No, no that's the, brass is, the brass is the Greece. Brass is the Greece. Greece. The iron is is the king of the north. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the king of the south. And the king of the south. They're two 
that wind up being they wind up being combined together. Uh, the two legs go into the feet and the toes of iron and clay. It's all one entity, but at at the very end, the clay is man, the iron is the supernatural element from these guys. The Antichrist is empowered by Satan. And, and we think the Antichrist might be the Assyrian, right? Mm -hmm. The Assyrian. Yeah. So that's from the you know the Syria. Right. Yeah. And then he might be a Syrian Jew, right? Assyrian uh, Jew. He will be a Jew. Yeah. Uh, because he comes in and confirms the covenant with Israel to reestablish the, the uh, temple worship. No Jew would accept somebody that wasn't Jewish. Amen. And so, but he's he's an Assyrian Jew, and uh, but he's Jewish. Cut. Uh, mm. That's in Isaiah ten one or something like that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Ten five, yeah, good one. Ten five. Yeah, yeah, that's the rod of my anger. My anger. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Five. But I'm looking. There's a passage here where it says he he doesn't pay any attention to the God of his fathers, but but worships the God of forces. The God of his fathers is is the God of Israel. Okay. Yeah, I, but, I remember but that he, verse. He, I don't know where it is. Yeah. Yeah, I, have, I think it, I think you're look, uh, looking for Daniel 11, verse 37, where it talks about him, neither shall Yeah, that's he, it. Okay. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, that's Israel, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not, Shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things? And so on. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with the glory. And Satan gives his power and authority. That's his God. So would that lend toward any um, last days development after the rapture, do you think, that would take place before the trip, the, the, the king of the north and south, or are they just going to be in place before that 70th week? Uh, things will start, uh, the first part of Daniel 11, in the early part there, from about 6 up to 20 or 21, those wars and, and back and forth between the king of the north and the king of the south, the uh, 70th week doesn't start till verse 23, where, the, where the, that guy, that, in 21 the Antichrist shows up, the vile king, and in 23 he signs the covenant. That's the start of the 70th week there. And then uh, in 31, that's the middle of the week where he goes in and stops the sacrifice and uh, demands that they worship him. And so, uh, what time frame does, is there any indication there of a time frame? Uh, in, in, in six to uh, twenty, there are several back and forth. Uh, the six, you have that the king's daughter of the south goes to the king of the north to form an agreement. But it doesn't work. Uh, in verse 7, a branch of her roots to stand up in a state and come with an army. So that's the king of the south. And he goes to the king of the north with his army and shall deal against them and shall prevail. 
uh, and carry away captives in verse 8, verse 9, so the king of the south shall come to his kingdom and shall return to his own, own land. But then in 10 it says, but his sons, and that's a reference to the king of the north, but his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through, then shall return and be stirred up even to his fortress, and the king of the south shall be moved with choler and shall come forth and fight with him. So that, that was somebody's son. So there's, I don't know if it's whole generation or the son was already there when the other stuff was going on and he got aggravated and raised an army and went after the other. But there's all down through there, all the way down to, to verse 20, there's all kinds of back and forth for wars and, and all. And the king of the south is Egypt and the king of the north is Syria and Israel's right in between and all this back and forth wars going on so they're taking a beating too. They may just they may be fighting over <laughs> right. the landmass of Israel. Right. So yeah. Okay. But but that all leads up to the actual showing up in verse twenty one of the Antichrist. So that would be those are cut off. Yeah. And then there's the gap, prophetic gap. Yeah. That would be that prophetic gap yeah. for the 70th week. Can be yeah, done. yeah. Okay. When we go out of here, then then the prophetic program can start back up just like where it cut off right. in Acts chapter 7. Because up until up until that time when and in verse chapter 9 when Paul got saved in Acts, up until that time, he's going out persecuting the church. Okay, they're going to be back in the same situation. The Jewish remnant is not going to be having a good time. So, but yeah, that just when, when the rapture takes place, the 70th week. Now they're going to be in some tribulation, but the 70th week of Daniel, that last seven years clock, doesn't start until uh, verse 23 of chapter 11, where he makes the league with Israel to give them protection and because they've been taking a beating up to them. <laughs> right. And the long suffering of God, his yeah. mercy is yeah. what, you know, as we've learned already this week, the, yeah. the reshaping and the and the uh, delays. God is being merciful and he's withholding, he's keeping these events. But yeah. like you say, it wouldn't make sense if the 70th week could begin immediately, yeah. if, if, if he that uh, let it will let till he be taken out of the way, yeah. his yeah. body of Christ, yeah. God is preventing the advancement of these king of the north, king of the south, yeah. that the Antichrist yeah. comes out. The, event, the, the events that, that bring that together right. are held in abatement. Right. As long as we're here, that. we're holding it back. Satan will have that liberty to begin working and those developments happen. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, You're welcome. My pleasure. Where can I buy your book? <laughs> They're all up here. <laughs> <laughs>